This is Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology Oncology. I am the voice of MDH Podcasts, Nick Andrews, and I am joined this episode, as I always am, by the host of the show, the editor-in-chief of MDH Hematology Oncology, Dr. David Henry. Dr. Henry and I were just in Maryland together discussing the future of the show and the future of MDH Hematology Oncology, and, and uh, David, I'm very excited for our new directions. Yeah, I really had a good meeting uh, for our listeners. Uh, we seem to be going strong and gaining new listeners all the time. Thank you very much. And um, our sponsors, MD Edge and um, uh, Medscape, uh, like the podcast as well. So we hope to continue bringing you interesting updates on interesting topics, right. including this one we're about to intro. Absolutely. We'll, we'll talk about it in the moment. I just wanted to announce a couple of things, not big changes, a couple of small changes one of which is that we are going to make it a, a, a larger point to provide the key takeaways from an interview and maybe ask questions such as what could go wrong, more about side effects. We're going to present, present those at the beginning of the show, and then the interviews will be obviously available in full, and you can kind of fill in the details yourself. But if you only have five minutes and, and you miss an episode, uh, you can still listen to the first five minutes and get the, the nuggets out of it. And I think that's a really great idea. Yeah, so that was what came out of our uh, board meeting, and so we hope our audience likes that, that we set you up up front with what's coming, some bullet points of what you're going to hear. So in case you finish your exercise routine or get to the office and have to pop out of the car, you've heard um, the highlights. Exactly. So let's get into uh, this week's episode. Dr. Ifi Osunquo is on the way, but out following Dr. Osunquo's clinical correlation with Dr. Alana Yerkowitz, the topic this week is uh, it's sadness, which means what you, how do you respond to friends and family when they ask you, doesn't your work as an oncologist make you sad? Isn't it depressing? And, and her, re, her reaction is, not really. It was actually much worse before I came an oncologist, and, and um, it, it's, it's inspiring more than that. You know, I remember when we first moved in the neighborhood where we lived and raised our kids uh, many years ago, and we'd go to cocktail parties in the neighborhood and uh, meet and greet. And of course, it's, you know, what do you do? And I'd say, uh, you know, I'm an oncologist. And they would say, oh, that's just awful. And I say, no, I, I really love it. It's wonderful. And people would start walking away from me. So I learned quickly to stop saying how much I enjoy because win or lose, I think we always make a difference. So at my cocktail parties from then on, I would say, you know, it's terribly hard being an oncologist, but the dirty secret is it really is wonderful specialty, getting better all the time. We do more, we succeed more, win or lose, we're there to help the patient. Yeah, absolutely. So that's clinical correlation. It's coming up after our interview with Dr. Ify Osunquo. So uh, the interview with Dr. Osunko was really interesting because you were in a situation that I'd never seen you before, and that was taken aback by something that you were doing incorrectly. And I'm pretty excited for everyone to hear uh, yeah, some of this interview. So, uh, yeah, well, the, I, I went down in flames on that one, yeah. as hopefully most of our listeners know. that. Uh, well, she's in a sickle cell expert, and she's really well-spoken, and we covered a lot of points The that my downfall was that I, I knew it was coming. <laughs> we have gotten into this habit because many of our patients say I've had it before give it to me again of IV Benadryl and she was aghast at this that you know, that's really a no-no and we're trying not to do that especially in our new patients and trying to talk our old ones out of it so hopefully our audience is not giving IV Benadryl because the patients do complain about itching and so forth sometimes from the narcotics but that really just makes things worse and we should avoid it. Yeah, and that, that makes total sense. But I, what, what really should scare everyone is the way that Dr. Osunquo looked at Dr. Henry was yeah. um, the way a coach looks at a quarterback who threw an interception. It was not good. Cer certainly, certainly scared me. And some of her highlights that we will touch that we did touch on and we're going to hear is um, that, that when they come in, of course, um, some more often than others with an exacerbation of their chronic pain, it may be a different new pain. She made that uh, point. And of course, uh, we've given so much opioid uh, she points out how we're trying to get away from that and use other techniques and adjuvants instead of just those opioids. And of course, they're in the hospital and we give high doses of many times dilaudid, which is more powerful than morphine. And then they go home and they may uh, not have as much strong medicine and withdraw. And, and another one I liked very much that she agreed with, I, I tried to recover myself from my Benadryl downfall. I said, oh, acute chest syndrome, you don't always come in with, it occurs after you're in. She said, yes, you're right. That occurs often as many as three days into a hospital admission, acute chest syndrome. And then she highlighted toward the end um, two new approvals recently, 2019, something to increase hemoglobin trade name Obrita, uh, Voxelodor, and then um, an antibody, Crixalizumab. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, the trade name is Adequivo, Adequo, um, reducing the frequency of vasoclusive crisis. It's fairly expensive, but it seems to work, and it's FDA approved for that, and she describes it. 
So that's coming up with the interview with Dr. Osunquo. Following the interview will be clinical correlation with Dr. Alana Yerkowitz. And if you like what you hear from Dr. Osunquo, she has participated in previous episodes of Blood and Cancer. So if you search Osunquo in your podcast app or in uh, your show section for your search engine within the show, you can find previous episodes from Dr. Osunquo and she will be prominently featured occasionally in, in the future. She's a, a remarkable guest and it was, a, it was quite the interview. So let's get to it. Very good. Here it comes. Welcome back to Blood and Cancer. I'm Dr. David Henry, editor of the online journal mdedge.com slash hematology-oncology. And we're here at the American Society of Hematology meeting in 2019, Orlando, where it's very warm and we're happy to be here as opposed to the cold northeast or other areas of the country where it's very cold. And I'm delighted to welcome you back to hear something about sickle cell on this particular episode. And I'm delighted to be with a friend and colleague, Dr. Ify Osunquo, who's a practicing hematologist oncologist. She is at the Levine Cancer Institute in Charlotte, North Carolina. And we're going to talk a little bit about sickle cell. Ify, welcome to this podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And, and so um, here at the hematology meetings, we're not quite finished the meetings, and we're being teased that tomorrow ASH is going to put out several guidelines, ITP, venous thromboembolism, and sickle cell. Mm -hmm. So I know you can't say much, but could you maybe give us a top-line overview of what do you anticipate the guidelines that are coming out tomorrow might cover? So one of the challenges with sickle cell disease is that there's not a lot of phase three randomized controlled trials to provide the evidence base for how we treat sickle cell disease, both at the super specialty level and at the primary care level. So what the guidelines, guidelines that are coming out tomorrow or this week are going to show is they synthesize all the data on cardiopulmonary and respiratory complications in sickle cell disease, and they're going to provide recommendations as to what should be standard of care for this population. Um, cardiopulmonary, renal, and um, uh, there's also going to be guidelines on transplant and chronic pain, and there'll be guidelines on um, how to manage blood clots in sickle cell disease. So they're going to come out in sequence. But I think the important thing is going to show that there's a lot of gaps in the literature, and there's a need for future research to address those gaps so that we can offer our patients the best care. So in practice, in my practice in Philadelphia, we have quite a large following of such patients. And of course, as the house staff and attendings take these patients, they always are addressing pain. I think maybe one thing, we could go in the entire episode all about <laughs> pain, but just to briefly touch on, uh, I think we do some things wrong in our practice. Maybe you can correct me. We admit the patients, they often say we'd like IV Benadryl. I, I'm glad this isn't on video because we see you <laughs> react to that. And so uh, is that right or wrong? And then they want dilaudid and they want it a lot. And um, we don't do a long acting. So your general top line approach to pain, I think it should be short acting and long acting. So could you maybe give a few pointers on that? So we need to understand the pathophysiology of pain in sickle cell disease. So sickle cell disease, you have acute episodes of vasoclusive crisis that result in tissue ischemia, and then that causes the pain. But you also, over time, when you have repeated episodes, you develop chronic pain. So you need to look at an individual with pain when they present. Is this an acute exacerbation of their chronic pain, or is this an independent acute episode of pain? Or is this their chronic pain with emotional distress? And I think historically, we treated all pain the same and didn't really look into the mechanism behind or the type of pain the patient is experiencing. So if you have a child who's presenting for their first or second or third VOC crisis, yes, you want to hydrate them, you want to treat them with a non-steroidal to address an inflammatory pathway, and an opioid to, tr to address the ischemic path of pain, knowing that it's not a cure or a, um, it doesn't solve the reason why they have pain, it just treats the symptom of pain. But as they get older, pain becomes more complicated. There's a lot of rewiring of the brain that happens, and repeated exposure to opioids causes tolerance, can, you can develop dependency, and you can develop hyperalgesia where the same amount of a trigger will cause you to experience pain more severely and more profoundly, and you will not respond to opioids like so you used true. to. Yeah. You know, so, so in my practice, what we've moved to is less chronic opioid use and more adjuvant use. So treat you know, neuropathic pain, treat sensory sensitization pain, treat depression that may exacerbate pain, and then look for the reason why they have pain. Do they have bone damage, they have vascular necrosis? Do they have a compression spine deformity? Do they have constipation? You'd be surprised at how many patients come in with abdominal and back pain, chest pain, arm pain, and they're profoundly constipated from opioid-induced constipation. And you give them you know, a laxative, clean them out, and then they go home the next day. 
The other thing that we haven't paid attention to is a very important side effect of opioids, which is withdrawal. When you get exposed to opioids over and over again, people will undergo withdrawal when you stop the opioid. They need to be taught how to wean off of IV opioids in the hospital when they're on their way home or when they get home and not stop it abruptly because there's a cycle of repeated admissions because they get high dose in the hospital, they go home, they stop it, they get withdrawal, that becomes painful, they come back to the hospital and the cycle continues. There is emerging data that using IV Benadryl can add to the respiratory suppression that you get from opioids. So many systems and hospitals are moving away from intravenous Benadryl, moving away from high dose IV Benadryl and giving oral um, to treat the itching that you get from being exposed to opioids. And maybe using other medicines like, you know, sarna lotion, you know, put some, you know, lubricate your skin, because a lot of this is how much toxicity do you want to allow to treat the pain. If I'm going to treat your pain with opioids because you're tolerant, you're going to need more. Well, maybe I wouldn't give you a sedating medication like Benadryl because I may knock you out and actually kill you if you get too much too sedating much. medication. Yeah. So it's a balance. And it's important to not just look at sickle cell pain as, oh, we've always done this. Let's just repeat what we've done over and over again. But really tease apart what's happening. Take a good history. What is actually going on with this patient? Makes so much sense. So I'm hearing the patient presents the emergency room in pain. We shouldn't opioids right away so to speak, throw at it, but instead, why are you like this? What's surrounding it? Is it bowel? Is it lung? Is absolutely. It a, is it pulmonary embolism? Is it a clot? And not just the opioids. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, that said, let's say we've done that and we have concluded that it, it, there is a need for opioid use. My conflicting thinking about how much of a PCA versus intermittent high-dose dosing, the patient is knocked out, that's a 1 out of 10, then they wake up in 3, 4 hours, and it's a 9 out of 10, how do you handle the chronic acute balance? So again, this has to be individualized. So when you give an IV opioid, you have to think about the half-life of the opioid. So morphine has a three to four hour half-life, hydromorphone has a two hour half-life. If you give enough pain medications to suppress all of their pain, it's gonna make them fall asleep. So you're gonna get a really big high of the dose of the medication, but in two hours, you're gonna get a drop in the level and they're gonna experience rebound pain. I'm a believer in using the patient's, uh, the, P the PCA machine, all right? It's the patient controlled analgesia. That way you give a little bit of a lower dose. So a basal going? A basal going in, mm -hmm. and then they, ha they can intimately press the button to receive more. Okay. That's safer in terms of the highs and lows of sedation that you can get with the pain medication. Now, sickle cell patients have been exposed to opiates for a very long time, so they will need a higher dose than everybody else. So it absolutely makes no sense to have somebody come into the hospital who's on, you know, 30 of oxycodone at home, and you give them a 0.5 dose of Dilaudid. That doesn't even convert from what they were taking at home when they're in mild pain, and now they're in acute pain. You're not really responding to their pharmacokinetic um, need for a pain medication. Again, it's all about education. When you teach the patients why you choose this method of treatment, they tend to be receptive, but the time to have this discussion is not when they're in acute distress. It's supposed to happen when they're outpatient, where you train them on how to manage their acute pain when it does happen. We're moving a lot, a, a lot towards individualized pain management plans. So the last set of guidelines from NHLBI talked about, you know, treat the patient with what worked the last time and make it individualized if you can. So if this worked for you, let's keep this as your standardized pain treatment plan. That way you don't have a disparate method of treating the patient that causes a lot of distress. So somebody gives the right dose, somebody doesn't give the right dose, either too much or too little, you end up with more toxicity and a lot of patient dissatisfaction. So if we then move before we get to um, maybe medication approvals that came out this year and maybe what we're hearing at this meeting, just briefly touch on the lungs that you mentioned in the beginning. So the patient has some shortness of breath. We think maybe it's a clot, maybe it's acute chest syndrome. So I'm called by the house staff to say, you know, we think she has acute chest syndrome. I'm looking to hear in this very empiric, in my experience, diagnosis, short of breath, hypoxia, infiltrate, pain. And mm -hmm. is that your standard approach to hearing what you want to hear and then go forward, maybe because you have to exchange the patient now? So acute chest syndrome is usually not subtle. If they come in and they are on room air, they're having some chest pain, they're not febrile, they're not um, profoundly hypoxic, and they have an infiltrate, that may be an ammonia or atelectasis. Usually when you, when, you, when you talk about acute chest syndrome, it's an acute chest syndrome. And okay. the syndrome includes fever, pain, difficulty breathing, or shortness of breath, hypoxia, and you, they clinically look sick. And that is a patient who you want to really emergently exchange or transfuse to get them out of distress. 
a lot of times patients may have shortness of breath for reasons other than pulmonary. Many of them have chronic lung changes that may confuse the picture. So what was their last x-ray look? What did the last chest x-ray look like? Is this the same um, infiltrate that was there like three months ago, or is this a new infiltrate? So it has to be a new pulmonary infiltrate in a sickle cell patient with the following symptoms of chest pain, fever, hypoxia, and respiratory dis- distress. And, and really, you know, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So you support yes. the patient, and if they're febrile, you treat, you know, for infection. If they're hypoxic, you treat that. And if you look at the trend in two, three hours, and they're moving in the wrong direction, then you intervene with um, the aggressive transfusion therapy. And I think I've learned that many of these acute chest syndromes may occur after admission. Absolutely. Most of them happen three Most. days into an admission. Okay. Right. You know, they come in and they're having a pain crisis. They lay in bed for two, three days without, you know, ventilating appropriately. They're giving a lot of fluids. It pulls into the lungs, you know, and then they develop acute chest syndrome. So just because they don't have it at presentation, you really want to look second and Need third day. to be day. aware. Yes, yes. And then I guess the last thing in the lungs is the their incidence is increased over non-sickle cell patients of, woman, of VTE, venous Absolutely. thromboembolism. Yeah. So I've heard, gee, you better be careful, dilate, hurt the kidneys. Your approach to someone who has shortness of breath, hypoxia, and doing either a VQ scan if the lungs have difficulty with a bio, within dilate or simply do the PE protocol CAT scan. And, and so that's a little tricky because, yes, their kidneys are impacted pretty early in their life with um, chronic kidney disease and renal insufficiency, but at the same time, a VTE can be life-threatening. And so my recommendation is if you suspect a PE, you've got to do the workup. Okay. okay. Be judicious. You know, get a good history. Examine. Don't automatically hear on the phone, I'm having shortness of breath, then go order it. But see the patient, make and do an examination like you would any other patient. And, you know, work the patient up for a PE right off the bat. Um, sometimes patients come in over and over again in a very short period of time. So you have to use a clinical judgment. Is this chest pain any different than the one they had two weeks ago or a week ago or two days ago? Do I need to do a, a, a VQ scan every, t- every time they come in? Mm-hmm. That's going to be a judgment call. But, again, just use good clinical expertise. I think people should not forget that sickle cell disease you can have everything that everybody else can have and have sickle cell complications. So I, I really want to stress that they don't ignore usual symptoms of regular medical complications if you're because concerned, of sickle cell disease. Work it up. Work it up, absolutely. Well, how about then as we end 2019, uh, our recording now in December, make us enthusiastic about 2020 and what's coming. What would you say happened this year in terms of maybe a drug or an approach approval or something you think might be coming out of these meetings that might help decrease our problems in our sickle cell patients? So this has been a banner year for sickle cell disease. We've had a banner three years. So in 2017, the second FDA-approved drug uh, came out, is Indari. And now two years later, we had two drugs approved within two weeks of each other for sickle cell disease. The first drug is called prizoluzumab or adacvio, and it's a P-selectin um, inhibitor that targets the adhesivity of red cells, white cells, and platelets to the endothelium. And it helps to reduce acute vasodilative crisis. The second drug, which is um, Voxelator, is a um, first-in-class hemoglobin polymerization inhibitor that raises your hemoglobin level by one gram over a period of time. And um, most, both of them are very tolerable. One is given IV, the antibody, the monoclonal antibody, and then the Voxelator is given by mouth. So now we have two more tools in a tool kit to treat sickle cell disease. Who should get those? When do you use them? So that's an interesting question. So the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease is complex. We have a single gene mutation, but it manifests in different pathophysiological mechanisms and pathways. So we have a hydroxyurea as a hemoglobin F inductor. That's one pathway. You have Endar, which is an antioxidant. That's another pathway. You have the P-selectin, which is an anti-inflammatory pathway. And then you have the hemoglobin polymerization pathway. My vision for the future for sickle cell disease is that people are going to use this in combination, kind of like how you treat diabetes and you know rheumatoid arthritis and other other diseases. But the package label for um, uh, crizolizumab talks about people who have frequent pain episodes to reduce a sickle cell vasodilator crisis, and for voxelator it talks about people who have a lot of hemolysis. And if you increase the hemoglobin level, you technically can reduce the amount of hemolysis. And hemolysis leads to some of the vascular complications that you see in sickle cell disease. And we need more time to see what the impact would be of these drugs on chronic and organ damage. And I think there's some ongoing studies by both uh, companies to try to understand the long-term benefit of the medication. That's really exciting. Gives us two new tools in the toolbox. It's, it's as been, we been before in sickle cell disease. This is great. <laughs> it, really, it really is. Well, as we end the year in two more days, three more days here at our meetings, anything you might have heard about that you think might be a presentation, not yet approved, that uh, gets us excited as well. 
there's been a lot of buzz about curative therapy. So there's a lot of investment, interest, passion, and advocacy around can we cure sickle cell disease and make this cure available to more people than we historically have had. Um, the typical individual with sickle cell disease has a 17% chance of finding a matched sibling donor for transplant, and transplantation with a bone marrow or a stem cell can cure the disease. But can you make this available to older people, um, to more people, more than that 17%? And so they're exploring things like haploidentical transplant, which is showing itself to be a viable it's model really for curing yeah. sickle cell disease open for older patients in their 40s and 50s. And then there's also gene therapy. You know, so that's the buzz that's going to probably be highlighted in the next three days, you know, using genetic uh, modification to really cure this genetic disorder. And there's different methodologies, different mechanisms. So you can do gene therapy that would insert a new hemoglobin um, um, gene or um, modify a, pre, a pre, precursor gene and induce hemoglobin F production. So there's different various pathways that we're trying to target. And we're getting promising results. So in my lifetime, I think this is going to be available to a lot more patients. Well, I think what a great note to end on. I've heard you say the word cure, so I'm going to hold you to that. And <laughs> thank you, Ify, very much for joining us for this uh, sickle cell update at the American Society of Hematology meetings 2019 here in Orlando, Florida. I've been speaking with Dr. Ify Osunquo, practicing hematologist oncologist, sickle cell expert at the Levine Cancer Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. Thank you very much, Ify. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank like, you. Likewise. Welcome back to Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDS Hematology Oncology. It's time now for Clinical Correlation and Dr. Alana Yerkowitz. I'm Dr. Alana Yerkowitz, and this is Clinical Correlation, a segment about the human side of hematology and oncology care. Sometimes it comes up in conversations that I'm a doctor doing a fellowship in cancer. The question I get from people who aren't in medicine is always the same. How do you deal with the sadness of your work? Or do you get depressed from it? I've always given a standard answer about compartmentalizing. I focus on my patients when I'm with them at work, and then I try to focus on myself when I'm not. That balance allows me to better be in the moment with my patients when they need it most. This weekend, I was visiting family and was asked the same question. But since I've talked about compartmentalization so often, this time I really stopped and thought a little harder before I answered. No, I said, honestly, I don't get depressed from my work. I would actually get depressed thinking about mortality and illness before I was in medicine. When I was in college, for instance, and would read a narrative about the experience of illness, I would feel depressed. Why? Why wasn't I more depressed now when I was seeing it up close and personal? And I realized it's because back then I felt helpless, hopeless, like things were terrible for people and I wasn't doing anything about it or even able to do anything about it. But now I don't get depressed, I said, because as simple as it sounds, I'm helping. I'm not a bystander on the sidelines capturing a tragic story. I'm actively shaping the outcome, and no, I don't want to put the doctor too much on a pedestal here. Yes, cancer will decide what it wants to do, even despite our best treatments. But even when it does, I can be there for the conversation, the reassurances, the dialogue about life and the meaning of it and what to focus on and how to optimize quality of life. I can do things that make people feel better even when the situation is bad. There's a school of thought that's commonly cited that as doctors progress through their medical training, they lose empathy. I've now completed four years of medical school, three years of a rigorous residency in internal medicine, and recently completed the rigorous clinical phase of my hematology and oncology fellowship. Nine years after I've started my medical training, I think the opposite is true. Being a doctor and having the privilege to work in this field only makes me more empathetic. Yes, the work is sad, but I am not depressed by it. I am hopeful. 
I am grateful to get the chance to be up close and personal and to do something about it, large or small, every day. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll tune in next time for Clinical Correlation. And that's a wrap on episode 54 of Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology Oncology. I am the voice of MDH podcast, Nick Andrews. Blood and Cancer is produced by Mary Ellen Schneider, executive editor, Kathy Scarbeck, multimedia editor, Terry Rudd. New episodes are available each and every Thursday.